Welcome back and this time it's all about cameras. Cameras for animation, that's right, finally. Long time in the making, announced a while back and asked around on social media and LinkedIn had a huge response. So here we go. This is gonna be a multi-part series where there's a lot to cover. Now, why cameras? Usually students are discouraged to animate cameras. It's kind of tricky to do and you can kind of ruin the shot and you have to be very careful in terms of what kind of moves you have. So usually we encourage as teachers, the students to just focus on the character animations, the character stuff and the mechanics and, the, and all the intricacies that, you know, it's really hard to just master the animation of just the character. Although for students, I would recommend that you at least kind of look at pans and tilts. It kind of opens up the shot and gives you more room for certain elements and certain actions. I would kind of look into that. But generally, students are discouraged. But when you move over to a company and the feature might be a bit less, but VFX for sure, you're going to deal with a lot of different camera elements and just different types of camera animation. I didn't learn any of this in school. This was purely just character stuff. So when I started that work, I was just thrown into the deep ends and faced with a ton of different camera types and storytelling methods and crazy stuff. So let me go through a couple examples to show you what we have to do. So sometimes you have a fully CG shot and you have a lot of freedom in there. It can be very dynamic and very interesting. Sometimes you have a full CG shot as less dynamic, but it's there specifically to tell a story point with a reveal. Sometimes you start with previous that is very dynamic. You kind of piggyback on that and continue to make it hopefully as cool as possible. And sometimes you get a shot where the previous is pretty much done and you kind of stick to that and you do the best you can with within those camera moves. And sometimes it's in the middle of production and we call that post-vis and you do your camera moves to tell stories, to follow elements. Sometimes the play element is fairly locked and you have a bit of wiggle room to move things around. And sometimes you are stuck with the plate and you have to relook at the timing of elements that are moving within the plate. And sometimes it's very forgiving with a very simple live action element. And sometimes it's all tied to a certain choreography, the timing, specific actions where you really have to animate to that specific camera move, the framing. Sometimes the depending on how it goes, you kind of veer off and you do your thing to tell a different story, but it's mostly all tied to that plate and sometimes that can be very tricky, but also very rewarding. Sometimes you have a plate that is very dynamic and all kinds of different complicated actions that all have to fit within a certain frame. Sometimes lenses change and they're very, very long. And sometimes the long lenses are there for a certain sense of scale and awe. And sometimes you have snap zooms and more snap zooms and more snap zooms. Sometimes you have transitions from a match move with a live action plate that then transitions into a CG element for a full CG shot. And sometimes you have a dolly zoom, depending on the action that for a very specific effect. And sometimes you animate camera moves that will transition into a continuing camera move in live action. And sometimes you have a shot that just has everything. You got live action elements, you got CG elements, you got transitions to more CG elements then combined with live action and CG. That then transitions back into live action and CG. That then has a handoff to fully CG with all the characters and elements being CG and making sure that the framing and everything that is presented is clear and tells the story. And even though I had fun animating all those shots, sometimes they can be kind of a puzzle. Like how do you put in all the storytelling poses within that camera move? Sometimes you're stuck with the move and it kind of changes your timing. So when you have shots in VFX, there's always an interesting challenge when everything is CG, everything is live action with CG or combination or handoffs. It's definitely never boring. And then you can take those elements and if you work at home, you can have some fun with camera shakes, or more handheld aspects of it. Again, putting in some snap zooms or just opening up the shot and doing some pan and tilt so that you can tell the story so it's not completely locked off. So as you can see, there's a lot to cover and that's why it's a multi-part series. And I will show you the things that I've learned and things that I'm teaching in my classes. And generally I will go over the basics, but then also go into more advanced techniques and more complex setups. And that's why this is a pro tip and not an FNA. So let's do this and let's start with lenses. After all this time, this is actually only my second clip where I introduce myself and I'm gonna do this from now on. My name is JD. If you're new to this channel here, I do lectures like this. I do acting analysis. I do animation analysis clips. I do rig reviews, animation news, product reviews, and I post all my workshop critiques on there. And if any of these topics are interesting to you, feel free to subscribe, hit that bell button, and then you don't miss any of my uploads. So why lenses first? Mainly because of habit and lazy. <laughs> it's not true. But usually when I teach in classes, that's the first thing that I talk about because as you start a shot, you got your perspective camera and your orthographic camera and usually the students will create new camera and then start animating and that is the immediate pitfall and this is why I want to start with lenses because when you go into Maya and you start a shot you will go create cameras and a camera here and what happens is that the focal length is a 35 
to a 35 millimeter, that's your standard Maya camera. But a 35 doesn't quite work for every action that you want to do. Like a more of a close up is going to have a weird distortion because of the wider lens. So usually this is what I show in my classes. You can see the effect that it has on the face, that it has on the environment. If you go through different lenses from a very wide to a very long, it can flatten the image, it can widen the image, it can introduce more elements into the frame. There are many, many differences depending on what lens you choose. So the lens choices and the distance from the objects to the camera is going to have a massive influence in terms of the composition, the framing, the content of your shot. So think about the shot. Is it an action shot? Is it a dynamic shot? Is it more of a lip sync and a portrait shot? Think about the feeling that you want to convey in your shot and then adjust your lenses accordingly. So as you start a shot, think about is it going to be a wide lens or is it going to be a long lens? But the real world camera information and the lenses is not the same as in Maya. That's where it can kind of get a bit complicated. So when you have your camera here, you got your angle of view, you got your focal length, your camera slate, but you also have your film back and you have all the information down here. In an actual camera, the film back refers to the plate where the negative is placed when it is exposed to light. The film gate is the gate that holds the film to the film back. Now, unless you're really trying to replicate the realistic camera information, the lens, everything for Maya, you don't really have to worry about this. But still, the names and the terms in Maya are just not quite the same as in real life. So when you talk about sensor size, film back, film format, you will actually see camera aperture in Maya. And you can see that this is also in inches and millimeters. Now the film gate dropdown list has presets available that you can use to match footage if necessary. So as you cycle through these, the 35mm Academy or a 35mm Anamorphic, you will see that those values are changing. The presets will adjust the camera aperture, the film aspect ratio and lens squeeze information. Now, as you adjust those things, there's one more thing you gotta pay attention to among many other things, but one of them is the difference between render resolution and film gate. So when you look through this camera, you're gonna create a sphere and this is what we're looking at. So in the attribute editor on the fit resolution gate, you can choose overscan. Under the display options, turn on film gate, turn on display resolution on the display options and turn off display gate mask. And you set overscan to 1.1 in my case here. And that way you can really see what is the film gate, what is the actual resolution. So for me, 1920 by 1080 is what's being rendered. But what I chose here is the 35 millimeter full aperture. And you can change this to Academy and again Anamorphic and change Overscan again to see what is going on. So those two boundaries can be totally different. Now, even if you match them, you only match the real world with the CG camera. You still will have to match the actual objects and their size within your scene. So if in real world, I'm filming myself and I'm, I'm six foot something, I'm 184 centimeters. And let's say I am whatever, like a medium away from the lens, that has to be the same within your scene. Your character has to be six feet or 184 centimeters and has to be a meter away from the lens. So that really matches the scale. So it's not just the camera information, but also the size and the scale of the objects within your scene. Because if any of this is not correct, the replication of what you see through your CG camera is going to be completely off. That's bad for a match move. So your tracking's off. Potential simulations of water and smoke, whatever, that can be off. And the lighting will be off. The light intensity, the fall off. So there's a lot to think about. And then at the end, I chose anamorphic. Well, if you choose that, then you got to think about distortion. The whole transition from a live action, transferring that onto a CG camera is very elaborate and can be fairly complicated. Now, that being said, if you want to dive into that, because that's really super nerdy, I have links in the description with more information, which give you information like this. Focal length is the optical magnification power of a lens. The field of view will be different on cameras with the same film back sizes using lenses of different focal lengths. The FOV will also be different if the cameras use lenses with the same focal lengths, but have different film back sizes. FOV is determined by the relationship between film back and focal length. So once you start nerding out with that, that rabbit hole goes fairly deep. Are you shooting on film or digital? What kind of sensor is it? Is it full frame? Is it cropped? So would you say that a 35 millimeter prime lens is kind of like a 55 in a digital environment? Depends. But then you can start nerding out about what the human eye sees. I mean, people say it's sometimes between 40 and 60 millimeter. Sometimes you read it's exactly 42 millimeter. But if you really look at what I'm looking at, if I'm looking at my lens, that stuff is really blurry. I mean, how do you really replicate what a human is seeing? All information is, of course, really, really important if you want to replicate real life in the CG environment. We're fairly lucky that sometimes on shows, when we select a camera, we have a lens kit. So it shows only the lenses that have been used during the actual production so that we don't come up with some crazy lenses that don't match the look and feel and the language that has been used in the live action elements. But if you're doing a full CG shot, I mean, you can use a 59.3 millimeter and who cares? <laughs> I mean, I know some people will care. 
Well, actually, it's not right. <laughs> totally get it. I mean, you can nerd out, it's totally fine. Then again, more information in the description if you really want to go deep into that topic. That being said, as I'm going to continue with the series, I will dive into some of those more complex elements. So it's not just going to be super basic, but it's going to be kind of a range between basic and super nerdy. For you, if you're working in a CG environment, fully CG, I would start looking at the focal length and the field of view. So if I go back into my and look at my camera here, you can see that if I change the angle of view, you can see how it changes on the camera presentation. Same thing with the focal length. It's just kind of neat, but then again, it doesn't really matter. You have to look through the camera and really compose your shots depending on that. I just want to show you what happens when you do this. And both angle of view and focal length are intertwined. So you move one, the other one's going to change. Now be mindful that this only applies to the camera you created. The ones that are existing in the camera, besides the perspective camera, those are orthographic cameras. So when you create a new camera, it's kind of like a perspective camera. You can look through this, move it around, zoom in and out, and so on. But if you look through an orthographic, you can see it's always flat. An orthographic, especially side cameras are really good for bouncing balls and the basic assignments because you can really see the spacing and arcs and trajectory of your bouncing ball. Usually when you start with the bouncing ball, orthographic cameras are the way to go. Now, as you saw, when you go into that menu, create camera, you do have a camera and aim. So you can move around your camera like this, but you do have this option here for the aim. You also have a camera aim and up. So you have this option again, and at the same time you have this as well. But generally, I just go create camera and animate this. Now you can nerd out and import an actual setup camera rig within Maya with the real world limitations of crane and all kinds of stuff, but that will be covered in another part of the series. So with all of this, when you're wondering, well, then what should I concentrate on? If you create a camera, like I just showed a simple camera, I would just worry about the FOV plus the composition and potentially lighting if, if that's your thing. And by composition, I actually include camera movement movements as well. I know composition within frame, but there's a lot of power in how you move the camera. Camera moves, another series. So composition, lenses, and lighting will give you the best bang for the buck. That's what I will concentrate on. Again, lighting, maybe not. If you're just going for animation, so your lens choices and your camera moves and the overall composition of the frame, that's what I will concentrate on. So as you move the camera away or to the object, you have to think in terms of a very wide lens. This could be establishing shot to more of a normal standard lens. I mean, kind of a portrait shot, or if the object is far away and you kind of have a very long zoom, it's a telephoto lens. So roughly in, in a broad sense, the bigger elements of your shot, something wide, something kind of normal, something a bit more zoomed in. Now a wide angle or a telephoto lens, that is going to change the field of view. So a shorter focal length is going to give you a wider field of view when you use a wide lens. This will give you more perspective. There's more to see within the frame. You can fit in more characters. There's a bigger set that you can show off. And if you get closer to the camera, it can also have very dynamic actions like in this shot. But with a wide lens, if you get closer closer to the camera, it's going to have certain distortions. It's because the distance to the lens. This that I'm using right here, this is my Sony a64 with a 14 millimeter lens. So if I go close, you can see how much it changes. You can see if I just move a little bit, there's a lot of movement with my hands and also the perceived speed. So if you have a wide lens and you do your acting shot and you move your head around, that might be a lot faster than you intended because of that perspective change. And if your character has a big French nose and you move it around, you're too close, that might just give you too much of a distortion that kind of distracts from the shot. But if you do a handheld kind of move with a wider lens, there's just less jitter and less noise on the movement. But if you go with a longer lens with a narrower field of view, speaking of handheld and you zoom in, it's going to inherit all the imperfections of whoever is holding this, or whatever influence on the camera, the jitter is going to be much more pronounced. Now with a longer lens, you will see less of the frame. It can be more claustrophobic. You can also feel a bit more detached. It could be maybe like a, a journalistic camera, kind of a documentary. Maybe you're too far away for what's going on. You got to zoom in. But the more you zoom, the more it flattens the image, which can give you a kind of a cool effect. So if you have a very long lens and you have a character in frame and it's potentially surrounded by other creatures, this might look very threatening and you can feel like this is just this big mountain of creatures attacking this character when in fact they're not that close so when you zoom out or change the lens you can see ah this is totally different the wider you go so think about that when you choose a lens you want to flatten that to make it a bit more oppressive and dangerous or you want to open it up and just give it a bit more air and obviously watch a ton of movies a lot of filmmakers have totally different approaches you can have movies with very long lenses and then you have other directors they go very very close this could be very close like a 12 to 14 or a 20 
21 to 27. I mean, this will kind of distort your face, but at the same time, it will also feel more personal because you really feel that you are close to the character. Versus if you're really far away, but you zoom into a face, it will just feel potentially a bit more detached and a bit more neutral potentially. So to go back to the Maya camera, if you create a camera, it's a 35. Again, you can debate on what does that mean, 35 compared to my camera or a film camera, but generally just watch out. That standard camera, if you do a close up, do an acting piece, there's going to be some distortion. The distance is going to be important. It's going to potentially distract from just the lip sync that you want to present. So maybe you're going to go on the 50, 55. Maybe you want to choose a longer lens to just kind of present that type of framing that is potentially less dynamic. Again, think about how close you get with the objects to the camera. So if you have a 35, maybe don't gesture too much to camera. Don't have your character sitting and then getting up like this, because then that will be a massive scale change in the head. Now in the film world, there are some standards in terms of a medium shot, a close up or a wide. But again, that will be a different part in this series for composition and framing. So generally you should ask yourself when you create the shot with camera and the lens and the, and the composition, and everything, what is the feeling you want to convey to the audience? So potentially go away from all the numbers and all the details and think about if I do this shot and this action, is it going to be personal? Is it going to be more detached and neutral? Is it going to be dynamic and potentially think further? So if you want to do something where the main character needs to be more personal, maybe it have a wider lens, you're more up close. But then if it switches to another character who's not the main character, maybe then make that a bit of a longer lens. It's a bit flatter, it's a bit more neutral. So you have a clear lens distinction depending on what character is in frame. So you can kind of switch up the importance. And some people might not notice, so it can be a bit more subconscious depending on how far you push and how obvious you want to do it. And of course, there's a lot more to think about. So you got your shot composition as you think about the different lenses. So then with the different lenses, you also have different depth of field. Then think about if you have an establishing shot, kind of a mid shot, a close up shot. Then in terms of composition, you got the rule of thirds. Think about the perspective, leading lines, and this and much more will be in the upcoming parts in the series, including dolly zooms, which I showed before. But dolly zooms, that to me is part of camera movement. So that's a separate part just about movement. But there will also be things that will not address like lens breathing. That exists. But to me, it's annoying. It's distracting. It's not really something I personally that I had to incorporate in any of my work. And you would think that you want to avoid that, but it does exist. So there are things that I can briefly mention like now, but I'm not going to go into topic. Feel free to Google lens breathing and maybe leave a comment. Maybe you did this. Maybe you at work or somewhere had to replicate lens breathing in CG. I'm very curious. Maybe you have an example that you did. Drop a comment. I'm very curious. Bam. That will cover lenses for now. Again, there's a lot more to cover in combination with lenses, but I want to leave you with that general topic. Choose your lenses wisely. Think about the feeling. Think about how your shot changes depending on your lens choice and the distance of the character to the camera and play with it. Have fun. Make it super dynamic. Make it super long. Flatten that image for something a bit more interesting like I showed before. And speaking of interesting, if this on my segue, if this was interesting and you want me to work with you on your shots, we can incorporate animation, but also camera stuff into your shot. I have workshops. They're always open. You can sign up at any time. Link in the description with all of the information. And if you don't want to miss all the upcoming parts, anything else that I upload, feel free to subscribe and hit that bell button. Comments are open. Any comments about this, any questions, feel free to let me know. Other than that, that's it for me. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.